Welcome to another episode of Rewiring Health. I am so honored to be joined with by Casey McGuire Davidson. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yes, me too. And we're going to talk about a topic that I know is going to be so beneficial to so many, especially this time of year. And we're going to talk about being sober and and the impacts of alcohol. And this is something that I was just telling Casey, I have not had on my show yet, but this is so important to talk about. So I can't wait to dive into this. And what I love, would love to hear from you is, can you talk a little bit about your journey? So where you started from and why you help the people that you help today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, what's interesting is that alcohol is such a big part of our society and such a big part of our culture. And and, you know, I had been conditioned my whole life to believe that, you know, drinking is a privilege of adulthood. It's sophisticated. It helps you have more fun. It helps you relax. Um, it's how you bond. And I think I'm not unusual in that sort of in that belief system, It you know, and um, I definitely, you know, hung on to that. Um, I was you know, a self-described red wine girl for a very long time. Um, I would actually like, when I was telling people about myself, it was almost part of my identity. I live in Seattle. I'm a mom. I work in marketing. I'm a red wine girl. I love to travel. Like that was equal to a lot of the other things in my life. And so I spent 20 years climbing the corporate ladder, you know, getting married, buying a house, having kids, um, and holding on really tightly to my love of wine. Um, I, you know, just felt like it was, as I said, the way I rewarded myself at the end of the day, it was what my husband and I did on date nights, we went to wine tasting regions for our anniversary. Um, I was a big, you know, I think I bought in really heavily to the wine mom culture. Once I had my son, I have two kids now. Um, a lot of the things I did to take care of myself and to enjoy life sort of fell away before I had him. I was taking guitar lessons and going to Pilates and going kayaking with my girlfriends. And once I had him, I was actually 32. I was older because I worked for a long time and traveled a lot with my husband, but I would run out of work at 6 p.m. to try to pick him up before daycare closed and then go home and do the bath, food, bed, eventually play Legos and then jump back on the computer. And so you could sort of multitask while working. You could be adult and get a reward while playing Legos, while jumping back on the computer. And something we don't talk about enough is that alcohol is actually addictive. Um, it, you know, you drink or I drank because I felt like I needed to relax. I believed it helped me sleep. I believed it was you know, helping with my anxiety and my reward, it actually spikes your anxiety. It spikes your cortisol. It interrupts your sleep. A single glass of wine decreases women's sleep quality by 24%. Anything over a glass of wine. So two glasses decreases it by 39%. And yet I thought it was helping me. So I started worrying about how much I was drinking, you know, when my son was maybe a year old, because I was trying to cut back, you know, I'll only have two drinks a night, I'll only drink on the weekends. Um, I tried switching from red wine to white wine, because I liked it less. Um, and I, it didn't work. And I was constantly sort of waking up at 3 a.m. and waking up with a low grade hangover and it was becoming more and more important to me. You know, I would be about to pick up my son and looking at the clock and debating whether I had time to dip into the store to buy a bottle of wine because I didn't think I had quote unquote enough at home or calling my husband and being like, hey, can you pick up X, Y, and Z at the store? 
and get me a bottle of wine. I mean, it was just absorbing a lot of my energy. And so a couple years of that, a couple years of trying to cut back on alcohol because stopping was literally my worst case scenario. I loved drinking. I just didn't like the effects of drinking. Um, I eventually hired a sobriety coach um, because I didn't want to go to a 12-step program. It, it didn't jam with my belief system. I did try it for a couple months. And I also, you know, you can spend a million days, hours, weeks debating, like, do I have a quote unquote serious problem? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. You know, alcohol is addictive. It's not good for your health. And it's actually easier to stop completely than it is to moderate, you know, quote unquote, moderating is really difficult to do because of the way alcohol works and the way you go into withdrawal. So um, anyway, I hired a sobriety coach. I emailed her. She lived in Paris. I did calls with her over Zoom, you know, every couple of weeks. And I stopped for a hundred days. I felt so much better. I stopped for six months, then a year. I think once I got to a year, I was like, I'm done. I don't want to go back to living the way I was when I was drinking. And I'm now eight years alcohol free. And um, I went back to coaching school when I was about three years sober um, because you know, I was in director fortune 500 company and I just didn't care anymore. Like I was drinking to cope with the anxiety and stress. And then when I stopped drinking, I was so much more interested in relationships and women and how they function in society and personal development. I was like, I want to explore this. And then I started coaching on nights and weekends. I went full time four years ago as a coach, as a podcast host, um, working in all things, women, alcohol, sobriety, over drinking, all that good stuff. That is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, it's such an amazing story and just journey. And what I love about it is that you took something that was a challenge for you and now made it became a gift for you could help other people. And I just, I love that. And I feel like it's like some of the times those things that are really hard in our life become our deepest purpose. So I love that you have taken that and used it to help others. And oh, thank you. It's just incredible. And one thing that really resonate resonate with me as you're speaking is like how much of a slippery slope it can become when, you know, it's just one drink and then it becomes another. And it's like, we don't realize how much it's consuming our life. And you said it towards the beginning, but it was wrapped up in your identity and that, that becomes very difficult. And I, and you're definitely not alone. There are so many because so many people who experience that because it is so wrapped up in society. And it's one of the few things that is literally toxic for our body. But if you don't drink your question, yes, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's so strange how the, the mentality around all that. And can you talk about some of those pressures that we experience that to drink and how society plays a role in it and the subconscious messages that we get from yeah. the media and, and all these things that feed into that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that there for a very, very long time has been the messaging. And I think the alcohol companies absolutely love this mental framework. There are those people who can't drink, right? They are the quote unquote alcoholics, which by the way, is not a medical term. It's a self-diagnosis and primarily associated with one single um, program, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, which was created almost 90 years ago by two white men. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a medical term. It's called alcohol use disorder. But the framework we've gotten from popular culture, popular media, um, and everything else is there are those people who are alcoholics. And then there's everyone else. And so you do not want to be in that category. This is honestly what I believe, what a million people believe. And therefore, just try to get it under control. You know, when you go into bars and restaurants and into the bathroom, it's like, don't drink and drive. 
don't drink when you're pregnant and otherwise quote unquote drink responsibly. And the impression there is if you do not drink too much and drive and if you are not pregnant, there is nothing to see here. There is no problem. And it is very hard to quote unquote drink responsibly an addictive substance that if working by design will have you drink more and more often of that addictive substance. Um, there is nothing wrong with you if it started with a glass or two of wine and it's become the bottle. That literally is the intended progression of consuming the substance. And I didn't realize that for the longest time. And I, you know, used to debate like, well, do I have a serious problem with alcohol or do I just abuse it? Because if I just abuse it, then I can get a handle on it. And I think the good news is that's really, really changing. Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, it's in the media all over the place, which I adore, um, what's called the sober curious movement. Mm -hmm. And it's really being driven by Gen Z and millennials who are drinking 30% less than their parents or grandparents were at the same age. The absolute biggest drinkers are baby boomers. I mean, I'm talking 70 and 80 year olds are downing the alcohol like crazy. Second biggest are Gen Xers, which I am, who kind of came of age in the time of Sex in the City and Bridget Jones' Diary and, you know, alcohol is the mom and modern woman steroid. I mean, there are articles written about like what you can tell about a woman based on what she drinks. You know, a uh, woman who drinks beer can hang with the boys. A woman who drinks uh, vodka, you know, is a badass. A woman who drinks wine is sophisticated, you know, all that shit. Sorry, all that <laughs> stuff. Can I swear? Yeah, that's fine. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so that's changing, meaning that when most people in the past have stopped drinking. When you don't drink, the question is why or just have one. It's no big deal. And you can be like, I'm on antibiotics. They're like, oh, who cares? Or you can be like, I'm working out in the morning. They're like, come on, you're too hard on yourself. Let's have fun. That is shifting. Um, in recent years, dry January is all over the news. I mean, I was just interviewed on Good Morning America on Saturday. I was quoted in the New York Times. And not to say this is about me, sorry, it sounds bad, but I'm just saying it is everywhere. If you look at the Today Show, MSNBC, financial publications, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, everybody is covering dry January and the rise in non-alcoholic beverages and the modern sober curious movement. And it's because there's this growing awareness that alcohol is actually bad for you, like mm -hmm. causes seven types of types of cancer bad for you. And it doesn't help you sleep. It actually is really bad for people's mental health. And people are thinking about like, oh, I'm cutting out gluten and I'm doing whole 30. Like, what about the wine I'm drinking every night? Was that way too long? Sorry. Well, that was amazing. No, I, I think that's, you described it perfectly. And it is that, that dichotomy. It's like you're in one field, you're told go, go, go. And then I, it's really refreshing to hear that there's some clarity and there's some uh, change in that mentality around it. Because again, it it's, I think it's found it really interesting when you talk about the different generations and the alcohol use, and then that, that's actually changing with yeah. the millennials and younger generation. I think that's that's so profound, and especially that now there's a you know a month dedicated to it, Dry January. Can you talk about that a little bit more? The purpose of Dry January, where we're not consuming alcohol, that's the intent behind it, and what that can do for someone when they at least make the intention of one month without alcohol. Yeah. What does that allow someone to do? as far as moving forward, maybe without alcohol in their life. Yeah, absolutely. So Dry January actually started almost a decade ago with this charitable organization in the UK called Alcohol um, Change UK. And the idea was just encouraging people to take one month away from alcohol after sort of the excesses of the holidays where everybody tends to drink a lot 
and just, you know, feel better, look better, reduce your waistline, less hangovers, all that good stuff. Over the year, it has become increasingly popular every single year. I mean, you can look at the Google search terms and they spike year over year and grow. Um, in the last two years, somewhere between 15 and 20% of American adults have participated. So that's like one in five wow. adults. And that is increasing this year. I bet the stats are going to be a lot higher. So you are not alone in doing dry January. This is a thing. It's a movement. It's in the news. Uh, and what I love about it is any time period away from alcohol and not just four days and I'll only drink on the weekends or two weeks because two weeks is literally when you're going through withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So you are more irritated and have higher anxiety and you're not sleeping well, maybe till day 12. And so two weeks really isn't enough time to feel and experience what you're like without alcohol. But in 30 days alcohol-free, you can reset your dopamine and your serotonin, which is your sort of happy hormone and mood stabilization um, in your body. And so when you drink on any regular basis, you're spiking your dopamine every single time really, really high. And what your body does is it wants to regulate. So it suppresses your natural level of dopamine and serotonin. So you are, it's not your imagination that you are happier when you drink. What's interesting is that that is because you've been drinking. So you don't know how calm or more peaceful or more content or joyful you would be without alcohol until you get to 30 days. That's kind of the amount of time it takes to get um, your levels reset. Alcohol actually also spikes your cortisol, your stress hormone for up to a week and a half after you drink. Wow. Um, even for people who drink within the quote unquote recommended guidelines of a drink a night for women, seven a week. So you need to get it out of your system to sort of be like, wow, this is how I sleep. This is how I feel. This is the energy I have without alcohol. The other thing you'll notice is your skin looks better, like significantly better. You have less bloating. Your eyes are brighter. Even if you don't lose a single pound, you'll have less bloating, both in your face and in your stomach. Um, just so many benefits. You will save a lot of money. Um, in my first month, not drinking, to be fair, I was kind of a bottle of wine a night girl, which by the way, is not that unusual. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of women do it and don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I saved $550 in my first month alcohol free. So there are a ton of benefits. And one thing I would say is say you do dry January or another 30 day challenge, and you go back to drinking, you will take that information with you. You will know how you felt without alcohol versus how you feel when you're drinking. And studies have shown that even people who do dry January tend to drink less in the months afterwards. So yeah, I love dry January. Yeah, I love that. And I love that concept. And it's just what I love about it is that curiosity of like, what would it be like? And it gives you that short window where it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Okay, I can do anything for 30 days. And now it allows your brain to start to rewire to realize that, oh, life can be better without this. And yeah. That's, that's why I, I love the concept of that because it gives you that clarity. And a lot of times alcohol can shroud any kind of clarity that you may have around that on top of all the, the ill effects that you talked about as far as the neurotransmitters and the hormones. I mean, that's, that's right there is pretty profound in how it's yeah. impacting your body. So I love the fact that it gives your mind and body a moment to feel what it's like without consuming it. 
Yeah. I would love for you to go down deeper a little bit more is that, so once we do dry January and someone's removed from that, but they've been using alcohol as a coping mechanism for the stress and things going on in their life. If the stress is still there because we're still working and dealing with family stuff and all this stuff in our life. And now we've removed that coping mechanism that we've relied on so deeply. What do we do? What's the next step so that we don't go back to that? Because that can often be pretty common to go back to what we're most familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think something that is not discussed enough is the fact that women in particular have been targeted and taught to drink as a coping mechanism, right? You're overwhelmed, you're stressed. You have, you know, when I was in the corporate world, you know, just a million, you know, death of a thousand cuts from, you know, passive aggressiveness or gaslighting or difficult, you know, just being a woman in the workplace. And then if you have kids, the second shift in the overloaded schedule, And so the answer that we've heard from society, from each other modeled on television is the idea of here, have a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, that is kind of a, a piss poor um, offering of a solution that we are given. We don't need a glass of wine. Most of us will take it, but we need help. We need Uh, time. We need connection. We need um, less work. We need our partner to chip in more, whatever it is. Um, And so wine's been described as like the modern woman steroid. Mm -hmm. The problem is it doesn't work. Um, It actually makes it harder. So the problem is that you do need ways to decompress. You do need ways to de-stress, but we've been using alcohol as like the easy button. So like bored drink, overwhelmed drink. We want to downshift really fast. I I was a sort of this great combination, I say a little sarcastically, of an overachiever and a people pleaser, right? So you're going full speed and then you finally get the kids to bed and you almost want to like downshift from like fifth to second or whatever really, really quickly. And Alcohol is a great way to do it. It hits your bloodstream really fast. Again, it doesn't work though. We it it feels like it works, but it actually makes it worse in terms of the impact on your body. So what you need to do is actually decompress more throughout the day and work on boundaries and work on habits, which are harder than just hitting yourself over the head with a bottle of wine or some version of that. So um, when I stop drinking, it's counterintuitive, but you kind of have to slow down before you spring forward. This is what I work with my my clients on. Um, you have to lower the bar for a couple of weeks. You are going to be tired. You are going to be irritable. Again, that's not because you're not drinking. It's because you were drinking. Um So everything kind of will annoy you for a little while. You, you know, you just need to do less. Your body is going to be tired. Um, And you kind of need to build this like lovely sober bubble. So I encourage women when they remove alcohol for any period of time to replace it with daily, what I call sober treats, right? You do deserve a reward for everything you're doing. But instead of going out to happy hour on Friday nights, you could ask your partner to get the kids or leave work a tiny bit early and get a massage or pick up takeout sushi and and cuddle up with a great movie on a Saturday night instead of drinking a lot so that you can then go for a run on Sunday morning or meet your girlfriends for yoga and brunch instead of a boozy night out you you know a sober treat can be getting an essential oil diffuser for your room or freaking taking a nap on the weekend for me it was like going to a coffee shop and reading a magazine by myself just things that you don't normally do because you're so busy But what that will do is it will keep you in this emotional green zone so that by the time the end of the day comes and your willpower is at the lowest, 
you're not so desperate for that automatic downshift. You're okay. You're okay. And so that's the shift that needs to happen. There's also a lot of work around the beliefs you have ingrained about what alcohol does for you and habit change. My approach to stopping drinking is really a habit and behavioral change approach, acknowledging that the substance is addictive, but mostly like, when do you drink? Why do you drink? What's your schedule? What triggers you to be like, damn, I need a drink right now. How can you institute shifts in your schedule, your habits, your boundary, your boundaries, your mindset to alleviate some of those so that taking a bath, getting a massage, getting sushi does make you as happy as drinking and it doesn't impact you the next day. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's just what I love is that there isn't that void. It's not like just stop drinking and then yeah. figure it out. It's like, okay, how can we get that same feel with things that are going to be long-term things that are genuine and authentic to yourself? And, and especially when you're working with belief systems, you're going to get something that's more aligned with you that actually yeah. feels good. And I, I just love that. And giving people options because it, it you know, especially when you talked in the beginning, you were talking about the joy it brought you, but then the fear of leaving it. And yeah, you're on both spectrums of the emotional scale where there's the, the fear, which is very real because it's something that you're holding on to. It's a comfort zone, but then there's the joy it brings you. So it's like, how do you navigate those emotions? And what I love is that you're still giving the joy to people, but giving it to them in a more healthy way. So I, I love that and allowing people to figure out what that is for them. And yeah. yeah. And just, you know, just as you're talking to is just how much of a band-aid that is on a gashing wound, you know, when we think yeah. that alcohol is going to solve our problems, like the wound is still bleeding. We're not doing anything for that. We're actually making it worse. So yeah, I mean, that's huge. But again, that messaging that we've all been fed, you know, we're living this stressful life. We just want something like you're saying to take the edge off. And now here we are like, stuck in this vicious cycle of feeling like we're, we're trapped and we, yes. we know we deserve better. And yeah. one thing I would love for you to dive into is how much does self-worth come into that? Mm-hmm. Because this is, I, you know, I heard a quote, like we lower ourselves to a level of our worth. And this can be a really big thing is that, you know, maybe if we're lacking that self-worth that we deserve better for ourselves, but yet we see the gap between what we're doing and what we want, how do you navigate that with someone? Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of women are really high achieving, do really well and feel like, why can't I get control of this one thing? Um, I don't want to tell anyone I'm worried about, about my drinking or I'm trying to come back and struggling with it, which to me is a little crazy. It's like this third rail with the stigma around like, if you struggle with it, therefore you have a problem, therefore it means X or Y women, at least women I work with and my friends, we talk about food all the time, right? Like, or I need to, I want to do, make this change in my life. I need to make that change in my life. I need to work out, you know, whatever it is. And of course that's tied to diet culture and all that crap, but alcohol is like this thing we never talk about. So it can really undermine your confidence in that, It's almost like this secret you don't want anyone to know. Mm -hmm. And waking up feeling like garbage and doing something that you said you were not going to do and doing it again really can undermine Mm -hmm. your confidence. I know when, you know, I was waking up feeling like garbage in the morning, the first thought out of my mind was like, what the hell is wrong with you? get your shit together. Mm -hmm. Like literally first thought in the morning, Mm -hmm. I didn't look as good as I wanted to. I kept saying I was going to do things. I'm going to run a 10 K. I never followed through. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, when I was two months sober, I ran a 10 K for the first time in like six years. And as I was crossing the finish line, I just remember it was so like tingly, I um, was almost in tears and the thought going through my mind, I ran it alone, was I am now a person who does what I say I'm going to do. Love that. And, you know, it's just, um, it's hard, right? You don't want anyone to know. Also, at least for myself, 
I felt like my value and my worth was tied to my productivity, tied to how much I could deliver. I wanted people to like me and not be quote unquote disappointed in me. I was like this gold star girl Mm -hmm. who was working really hard for the pat on the head, regardless of whether it was my father when I was in college, you know, who I adored or my boss when I was freaking 35 years old and really should have been beyond that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was so much pressure in my mind. I drank to turn my mind off at the end of the night Mm -hmm. to just be like, oh my God, stop with the anxiety and the to-do list. And it was like the thing I could do to be like, have my own personal party on my couch. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And and so like, you you can just, you can feel it as you're speaking. And it's like, what I love is that like, you're talking about that self-trust and it's like when you were drinking and you're waking up in the morning, it's like, you weren't holding your word to yourself, you know, you weren't making that. But then the 10 K was like that evidence of like, wow, I do hold my word and I do, I can trust myself. And I, I just love that. And that is such a crucial part to healing. Cause if you can start to trust yourself, now you have personal integrity and that's like so powerful for doing anything big in life. When you yeah. say you're going to do something and you do it, that is just huge yeah. for making big leaps and bounds towards big things and really being your authentic self and doing what you're meant to do here. So I love that. You know, it's interesting. So many, you know, in terms of confidence and, and integrity and what you do, so many women I work with is like, are like, why can't I do this? Why do I not have discipline? Why do I not have willpower? And I'm just like, oh my God, do you know how much discipline it takes to keep functioning at a really hard level with a low grade hangover every day of your life and not sleeping through the Mm -hmm. night? Like, I hadn't slept through the night in years and I didn't realize sober sleep, by the way, oh my God, it's the best thing in the entire world. Everybody is like, did you guys know about this thing that you could like wake up and be like, la, 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 you know, as opposed to, oh my God, how am I going to deal with life today? Yeah. But, you know, I tell these women, like you are running a marathon with a ball and chain tied to your ankle and you don't even know it. And the fact that you are doing the America, the marathon is a freaking miracle. Take off that ball and chain. You will be shocked at how much more ease you have in your life because you are, you know, incredible. Mm -hmm. And yet, oh my God, you're making it so hard on yourself. Yeah. It's it's like have that, that power within yourself, but it's like when you're the alcohol shrouds what you have in within yeah. yourself. That you don't even realize how amazing you are until you can remove yourself. And yeah, yeah, I love that. One thing I would love to hear you talk about because hearing the transformation, I think is so powerful for someone maybe who's going through this right now and doesn't know what the other side looks like. And I know you mentioned you have two children. Can you talk about how your relationship with your kids has changed or how you've been able to show up for them yeah. since making this transformation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's interesting. So I have a podcast for sober, curious women, and I actually had my nine-year-old daughter, Lila, on the podcast um, a few episodes ago to talk about how to talk to your kids when you stop drinking, how to explain it, what to say to them, um, what they think. It was really, you know, she's, I quit drinking when she was two, when my son was eight years old. So I've experienced parenting both drinking a ton as a working mom and not drinking at all as a working mom. And, you know, my husband still drinks too. So like, how do you talk to kids about not demonizing alcohol or anyone who drinks, Mm -hmm. but also having them understand that it's addictive and what it does to your body? And, you know, how do you do that in a way that kids understand your question was how my relationship with them has changed. And one of the big motivators for me was when my son was eight, you know, I was still a really good mom. And I also had my husband on the podcast and we talked about it, you know, trying to keep everything going, trying to make sure nothing fell through the cracks. When I was ready to stop drinking, I was like, yikes, things are falling through the cracks, you know? 
but um you know and it was like oh do you mind not jumping on the couch mommy doesn't feel so good you know like just Mm -hmm. stuff like that or like falling asleep on the couch aka passing out my husband couldn't wake me up Mm -hmm. and just feeling so bad the next day that I was like in crazy mode trying to overcompensate and pretend there was nothing to see here one of my big motivations was knowing that drinking is progressive and what I was feeling and where I was at the time I stopped. I projected that out a decade and thought, when my son is 18, is he going to want to bring his friends home at night? Like just that broke my heart. I wanted to have a really close relationship with my kids. And the good news is I do. He is 15 now. We are super close other than the fact he's a teenage boy and like needs to like have more privacy and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, I bribe him. I'm like, hey, if I go to the grocery store for you, will you cuddle me? And he's like, fine. And we'll like watch a TV show with me. But um, yeah, I have to bribe him sometimes, (laughs) but he still cuddles me. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, just I like that they don't see that wine is required. I grew up with a wine bottle on the dinner table every single night. I like that they know that alcohol is addictive. They know that, um, how it impacts your body. They know how it impacts your sleep. Um, like I said about Gen Z, I think it has to do with social media and how much of their lives are on camera. Mm -hmm. They shockingly don't think binge drinking is that cool and attractive as we did in college. Mm -hmm. Um, Puking is not that attractive. Slurring is not that attractive. They're very aware of the connection between alcohol and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. Um, Both men who've been drinking and women who've been drinking, Mm -hmm. um, the factor, the way that factors in. And so I like being able to talk about it and contribute to it and model it. And also my husband's the guy who can drink one or two beers a night and like sits down on the couch with his phone and like forgets the beers on the kitchen table. And Mm -hmm. I'm just like, who are you? This is not a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I think just seeing that transformation and like recognizing, you know, the importance of that relationship. And I'm sure there's many people who have kids that are challenged with, the alcohol in their life and just seeing that like wow like the relationship with your kids is flourished you flourished you know there's so many benefits to taking care of yourself and not going towards alcohol for that so thank you for sharing that one more question I want to ask you for someone who is listening to this and this is coming out end of January you know um, and they want to partake in dry January or at least start their 30 days right now What is something they can do right now that would set them up for success for that dry January period? Yeah. Well, I actually have a 30 day guide on my website that is 30 tips for your first month alcohol free. It will take you through what to expect your first weekend, what to expect, how you will feel on day 16, what to focus on, how to shift your mindset how to go to the store and stock up on snacks and sober treats and um, non-alcoholic beverages. There are incredible options for um, non-alcoholic beer and, you know, wine. I was a red wine girl, still have not found the right non-alcoholic wine. That's probably okay for me, but sparkling uh, Prosecco and bubbly rosé and spirits even. You can have a Manhattan if that's your jam. So I like the idea. Another uh, podcaster said, uh, keep the ritual, change the ingredients. Mm. That's super helpful. I would also say, think of it as a health kick and a wellness kick and an experiment. Approach it with curiosity and tell people what you're doing. And don't you don't have to tell them, oh, I'm worried about how much I'm drinking or X, Y, Z. Just say, you know, I feel like I would sleep better and have less anxiety or would be able to um, feel better in the mornings and actually go work out or whatever it is, be more present. 
if I didn't drink, so I'm doing a 30 day experiment. Mm -hmm. And I think telling people, including telling your kids keeps you much more accountable. The other thing I would say is please get the alcohol of your choice out of the home in a perfect world. Hey, your partner might do it with you and they might also not drink or they may not have alcohol in the home. Um, my husband, I never asked him to not drink at all, but I said, I, I cannot have wine in my home, any kind of wine. I just can't. It would be like having a birthday cake with like three slices out of it on my kitchen table and trying to walk by it. I mean, I would take a mini slice and then a mini slice, you know, it just, why torture yourself? So get the alcohol out of your house, tell everyone you're doing this, see it as a period of self-care, trade those boozy nights for lovely mornings and take care of your body. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll definitely put the link to the guide in there. That sounds like such a great guide, especially when you know what to expect. Yeah. It's like, you realize that everything you're going through is normal and that you actually, it validates the process that you're in if you are going through those things. So that is such a valuable resource for someone who is working through this. So thank you so much. And for someone who wanted to connect with you, how can they find you? Yeah. My website is hello someday coaching.com. And on there, you can find my free 30 day guide, the link to my podcast. My podcast is the Hello Someday podcast for sober, curious women. And I have 200 episodes on every subject out there, including burnout and perfectionism and imposter syndrome and parenting and all that good stuff. And uh, on my website, you can also find my online coaching program. It has a community and membership as well. It's called the Sobriety Starter Kit if you want to go a little deeper with more support. I love that. And I'll put all the links in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, definitely check that out and listen to our podcast and subscribe and, and definitely get all the free resources you can and definitely connect with Casey. And I just want to thank you so much for everything you shared today and for really being such an advocate for something that's so important. For, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you for bringing this up and having me on. It's wonderful to meet you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great to meet you too. And again, for everyone who's listening, please share this episode so that it can help someone else who maybe is challenged with this and needs the resources to really work through it. So thank you again.